letting let's take out our Bibles. And have you have you fed? Have you been fed this morning? Have you have you partaken of any food yet? Or are you still hungry? Are you still starving? Are you still empty? The banquet's already started. I hope you know that. It started before you ever came in. And God is at the table. God invites you to a feast so that you can leave this morning full and overflowing. But you have to choose to come because, you know, you can show up and still leave empty, right? You, you, you can come and you can worship and you can be in the presence of God. But if you haven't opened your heart to his power and his love, then you could leave starving to death into this world. I want you to imagine uh, a banquet table. Last week, we actually, for those of you who weren't here, we this looked completely different, right? We had a meal together at tables and um, then we had communion as part of that meal. And comments that I heard over and over again about last week were, you know, it was different. It was a little challenging because we've never done anything like that. But I got to talk to some people at, at church that I've never talked to before. And it was encouraging and it was inspiring to fellowship and have table fellowship with people that we had Christ in common. Right? But we really didn't know. So Jesus this morning in Luke chapter 14 has a lot to say about table fellowship. What happens at the table? What shouldn't happen at the table? Who's invited to the table? Where do you sit at this feast that Jesus invites us to? Every morning as Christians, every morning, you get out of bed and there's an invitation on the floor before you even put your shoes on. And it is from God. He invites you to a kingdom feast every day of your life. He's there and his arms are open and he says, will you come? Will, will you accept this invitation? Jesus has written your name on the envelope. He's engraved your name in his heart. God invites us to a kingdom feast. Now, I want you to understand it's a kingdom feast, you see. It's a feast with the king in his kingdom. And all the king has to offer He's serving you unbelievably fresh fruit, large fruit, tasty fruit, the fruit of the Spirit of God. That's what's served. Love, joy, the peace that you long for, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all those fruits that we long for in this world and we seek in this world for children of God. He says, they're available and I, I give them to you and His feast is available for you today because you're my child, because of your faith in Jesus Christ. And what an amazing kingdom feast it is. Will you accept the invitation? Will you choose to come? The choice seems easy. It really does. Jesus is there. Jesus is present. Even this morning as we feast, he's in our midst. And we choose to drink living water from a well that never runs dry. And we choose to hunger and thirst for righteousness sake. 
And Jesus says, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For you will be filled. So will you be filled this morning? Let's pray. God, we come this morning distracted. We come this morning starving. Thirsting for what you have to offer, Lord. Thank you that you are present. Thank you, God, that you are in this place. And thank you, God, that you love us so much, God. And your table, the table spread, the banquet's ready. And, and God, just sometimes we come and we just don't feed. We're not nurtured, nurtured like you want us to be, God. Could you be with each person here this morning, Lord? Please, God, help us not to go away hungry and starving into a cold world most of which does not know you. Every day, God, may we partake of what you offer us. In Jesus' name, amen. When I get an invitation to a dinner, I like to know at least two things. First is who's invited, okay? Who, who's invited to the dinner? And what are they serving, okay? <laughs> So I've learned over the years that we have just some amazing, um, talented cooks at this congregation. And uh, I just, the first two I thought of were the Kathleen's, Kathleen Edwards and Kathleen Burke. If, if they're ever going to be somewhere and I know they've prepared food, I want to show up, okay? <laughs> Kathleen Edwards makes these, I don't know, like they're pot stickers or something, but oh, they are dumplings, I don't know, but they are so good. And Kathleen Burke, well, she, she makes great food, but she, she makes German chocolate cake. That's my favorite cake in the world. And so I'm thinking, just by chance, maybe Kathleen has made some German chocolate cake for me. I'll take it any time, Kathleen. Any time you want to make that, I will eat that. Well, how about who comes? Who comes? All right, so, so let's just dream for a moment. I, imagine that you received this invitation and it said, okay, we're having dinner and you can invite any one person in the world that you want to be there. Who would you invite to be at the table? Would it be a movie star? Would it be uh, Justin Timberlake? Or maybe Ryan Gosling? from La La Land. Taylor Swift, yes, I am a big Taylor Swift fan, but she would be one of the top five. Jennifer Lawrence, maybe. Who would you invite, invite to this dinner? Let's dream for a little bit. A movie star, a model, a wise person, maybe a powerful person, a rich person, a famous person. Imagine you could sit down with anyone and have dinner with them. Who would you like to bring? And since we're dreaming, what would be your meal of choice that you would have? Anything you want, you can have it. We actually, for the first time, actually we didn't, but someone was, that was with us at Disneyland Epcot Center had a, a seven-course meal. Uh, never had seen a seven-course meal before. It was phenomenal. Have you ever been invited to a dinner and, and, and you want to know who's there and you find out who's there before you've said whether you'll come or not and then you find out who's there and you change your mind that you don't want to come? I mean, that actually can happen. Who's showing up? Well, so-and-so's going to be there. Oh, I'm busy. Sorry, can't make it. Okay. Can't be there at this one. Well, we're going to hear a story this morning that Jesus tells. It's about a great feast that is thrown by a man. God actually is symbolized as the man throwing the feast in the story. And we are the ones who are invited to the table. But I want you to just, just think about the fact that it's God that's inviting you to this feast. What do you think of when you think of being in the presence of God? And that, like marinate on that just for a moment. A holy God, an all-powerful God, an all-knowing God, an omnipresent God, a, a, a loving God, a caring God, a righteous God, a holy God, a wrathful God. He's there. His arms are open. God invites us. Before Jesus tells this story, I want to give you some background, 
some context. Jesus actually is, is in the setting of a meal. He's, he's at a table. And the Bible says he was invited to this meal by a, a prominent Pharisee. So in other words, he's like high up, I guess, in, in the religious uh, realm of his peers. He's a prominent Pharisee. And they invite Jesus to this table. And Jesus is sitting there and it says they're watching Jesus very closely. They're watching him because they're very suspect of Jesus as he's at this table. They don't like what Jesus is doing on the Sabbath. And they actually have a lame man come in, but they don't think Jesus should heal the lame man. Can you imagine that? Because it's the Sabbath. So they're tricking him, you see. He's there. Is he going to heal this man or not? I feel sorry for this lame man that's there and has the opportunity to be healed by Jesus Christ, but he's just a pawn. He's just there. They don't want Jesus to, or they might want Jesus to heal him so they can trap him. That's the setting of this dinner. So Jesus is at the table and he's just kind of sitting there and he's observing who's coming and how they are jockeying for positions at the table. See, in that culture, whoever sits by the head of the table is kind of like with the head of the table. They're kind of like honored in that spot. And the farther you are away from the host, at least you made it to dinner, but you're kind of down the scale. And so they come in and Jesus just sees them trying to fight for the spot closest to the host because he's prominent. And maybe some of his reputation will just kind of run off on you or people will look to, oh, wow, they got to sit by the host. So Jesus just notices them all coming in and he, he tells a little story. He says, you know, you ought to choose the place farthest from the host and be asked to come up and sit by the host. It's much better than sitting by the host and being asked to say, oh, that seat's not for you, sorry. <laughs> and you move down a little bit. So he, he's just, see, Jesus is undressing, undressing their spiritual eliteness right in front of them. You may or may not want to invite Jesus to supper because he's going to lay you bare. He's going to speak truth to your heart. He's going to speak truth to your heart this morning if you will listen to what he has to share. Another thing that he's observing is people are coming in and they're trying to get closest to the host as he noticed who's invited. It's all the club, all the insiders. And as Jesus watches the people that are there, he tells another story. And basically, Jesus said to the host, you invited all the wrong people. All the people that should be here aren't here. You've invited the wrong crowd. Instead, you should invite and invite the sick and the lame and the blind and the poor. That's who you should invite to table fellowship because they can't pay you back. You see, all these people scratch my back. I'll scratch your back. They can all pay you back. So that is the background to the story that Jesus shares. As things are getting very awkward before he shares this story, you know how you ever been to dinner where all of a sudden things just kind of get awkward? Like somebody said, Jesus is the one who's making it awkward. And people are fidgeting in their seats and they're highly uncomfortable. And so one, one guy there, it's probably would, would be me because I don't like those awkward situations. He says, well, hey, we're all going to be at the great feast, the feast in the kingdom of God. That's something everybody could agree with that was there. We're going to be at the kingdom of God's table. And all the people who get there nodding, yeah, well, I'm going to be there. I'll see you there. Yeah, he's going to be there. She's going to be there. You're going to be there. Yep, we're in. We can agree on that. It's like just this, this, this guy just throws it out to try to release the tension. But it heightens it with the story that Jesus shares. Hear the word of God this morning. Luke 14, verse 16. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one says, well, I just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please, excuse me. Another said, 
I just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married. <laughs> I can't come. Ball and chain already. Can't make it. <laughs> Verse 21. The servant came back and reported this to the master. And the owner of the house became angry. And he ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you've ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told the servant, go out in the roads and the country lanes and compel them. Compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Now, it's dead silence at the table. At the dinner table, there's anger. Jesus is never invited back to have dinner at a Pharisee's house. They don't like what Jesus, they don't like the people Jesus eats with. They don't like what's being served. They refuse to come to his banquet. Excuses can prevent us from feasting with God. Excuses can, can stop us, can, can get in the way of this spiritual banquet every day that God has for us. And the first guy, you see these excuses, he says, I just bought a field and I must go and see it. Well, if you haven't seen it, why'd you buy it? I mean, that's kind of, I don't get that. Uh, or maybe he'd seen it, but he wants to check it out a little further, but he's already given his money for it. That, that's not a good excuse, right? It's this earthly thing that he's concerned about. Same with the other guy. He says, well, I just bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. Well, if you hadn't tried them out yet, why did you pay for them? Why did you buy these oxen? Please excuse me. Then the other, I just got married. I can't come. Oh, he's a family man, you see. But that can get in the way of the feast that God has for us. They're not the best excuses, and yet we can do the same, can't we? We make excuses because the things of this world crowd us out from this dinner that God, in this feast, this kingdom feast God invites us to. The busyness of life, the concerns the life, the family, the kids, busy. It's just this culture is non-stop, fast, go, 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 go. Always something to do. They just crowd out God. Sports, I love sports. But I think sports can keep us from the feast that God has for us. We can overwork to pay bills. To, I understand that. And, and sports aren't bad and work's not bad. Unless they are the things that are preventing us from worshiping and being in relationship with God. So it's probably different for each of us, but I know we all have excuses. What are your excuses? We look at other people's excuses and say, well, that's a lame excuse. My excuse? That's a good excuse. <laughs> Why I can't feast every day at the table of my father. God invites us to this kingdom feast. And God's kingdom is unimaginable. I mean, the things that God offers us through relationship. God is holy. God is above all else. He says, come to this table fellowship. I want you to imagine for just a moment that, um, well, actually, did you know, I, I've heard that most Americans are just one paycheck away from, you know, being homeless. Maybe two paychecks away. If they go two weeks without receiving a paycheck, financially they're going to be in big trouble. And there's a lot of anxiety and worry about that. But I want you just to imagine that you did lose your job for a moment. And maybe it got so bad that, that you ended up on the street. And we have some here this morning that, that have been on the street. And you know what it can be like. It's hard to live on the street. 
But imagine you're there. Maybe you end up at, at, at a place, you know, that's as bad, like like some areas of downtown LA or Watts, and you're and you're there and you're destitute and you're laying down and you're hungry and you're lonely and you're cold and you're tired. And you have no no money for, for really anything. You're completely destitute. And you're laying there and you haven't showered in days and, and you smell. And Jesus pulls up in this limousine. He's driving. It is a pristine limousine. I mean, it is just not a nick in it. It's beautiful. It's shiny. It's 50 feet long. Jesus pulls up and you're there and he, he rolls down the window and he's got a little hat on and he says, hey, get in. We're going to a feast. We're going to a banquet. And you're invited to come. Why would you not get in the limousine? Why would you make excuses? Here's a few. Maybe you can come up with some of your own but of why you wouldn't get in. First of all, if you don't really know the driver, you're not going to get in. If it says it's Jesus, but you don't know it's really Jesus, then there's going to be fear there. Who is this and why are they inviting me? So you have to know the driver. Or you don't trust the driver. You know who they are. They've said who they are. But you just don't trust them enough to get in. Or you don't value the driver. You don't know the driver. You don't trust the driver. Or you don't value the driver and what he has to offer. That's priorities. Or you don't like the company. So you say, sure, I'll get in. And they open this big, long door to the stretch limo. And as you peek in and you look around, you're like, huh? Oh, not getting in there with those people. No, thank you. I'll wait for the next limo to come along. <laughs> Have you seen this show? This is the greatest entertainer. Showman, thank you. I know it's important. The greatest showman. And this is a true story, Bar the Barnum and Bailey Circus. And this is the story of Barnum. And if you haven't seen this musical, I just really uh, would say see this. He's, he's in the middle there. But he becomes very famous in real life at one point because of all the misfits that he invited to be a part of his circus. You've got standing next to him the bearded lady. And then you've got... You know, the, the tall man, and then you've got the tattooed man, and, and just, uh, the, the, just the mix, the variety. Everybody there is a bit of a misfit. And there's a scene in the movie which was striking to me, because they're all, um, he's become famous, and he's been invited to this very prominent banquet, to go in and dine with all, and you know, rub shoulders with all these top people in the entertainment world. And his friends all want to go with him because this is a wonderful party. And they get to this party and he walks in, he opens the door, he turns around and he closes the door before any of them can go in. He says, you're not welcome in this place. He shuts the door in their face. And those are the ones that were family to him. Those were the ones that got him to where he is. And yet now that he's famous, he, he doesn't want these misfits to tarnish his reputation. So maybe you look into the limo and you think, oh no, I don't want to ride with these type people. Your pride and your arrogance get in the way of you coming with these people to this feast of God. Maybe you don't like what's being served. 
well, this church serves this and this church serves that. And those people, they've got just an amazing band. And, you know, they've got such wonderful music. Or this church, boy, you got to hear this speaker. Man, he is he's just phenomenal. But, you know, you don't have to go to church for that anymore because you have this thing called the Internet. So you can listen to some of the best sermons, the best lessons, and not even leave your home. And you can hear some of the best music and the best singing and just stay right there. And maybe that, that keeps you from coming to the feast that God lays before us. Or maybe you feel like a misfit. I don't belong there. Maybe, just maybe, you know who Jesus is. You know he's the driver of the limo. But you're laying in the street and you're dirty and you think, I'm not worthy to come into his presence. I'm not worthy to be in the presence of God. And so because of your sin in your life and because of your guilt, see, there's a whole lot of reasons why you wouldn't come to the feast, why you wouldn't get into the limo. Maybe it's comparing. Comparison can be such a rough game when it comes to church or when it comes to neighbors. Jesus would call it judgment. And so there's a lot of judgment there. And so you look, well, I'm not that bad off. I don't, I don't need religion. I don't, I don't need this banquet. I've got my own banquet, you know. And, and look at those people. They're so broken. They're so hurting. Why would I want to worship with a group like that? Why do we make excuses? We don't see the value in things in the world appear sometimes better than what Jesus is offering. So, you have to know the host. You have to know what's being served. You have to know you are unworthy. You are. You are the misfit. I'm unworthy. In fact, say that to the person next to you. I'm unworthy. Oh, you don't know how true that is. To come into the presence of Jesus Christ this morning. You have to stop comparing and you've got to eat what's being offered. And you can show up every day. And as God's community on Sundays. What prevents you from coming to the feast this morning? Is it sin? I love the song. Um, well, it's, we are all unworthy. Come just as you are. We are all unworthy to enter the presence of God. For He We're unworthy, and yet God invites us to come to the table and to dine with Him. And there's two things God wants us to do, at least. First of all, He wants us to come. He wants us to show up. And He also wants us to compel others to come to the feast. That's what Jesus says in this story. Go out into the streets and compel other people to come. First, you come, but compel, invite other people to come. Why? Because the love of God compels us to be messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus wants his house to be full. God says, go out, go out, and, and, and I want my house to be full. And he says, now the table's spread, everything's ready, now's the time. So God is having an outrageously fantastic banquet. You've received an invitation, a banquet in his kingdom, where the most amazing feast is being served, a spiritual feast, a love feast full of joy and peace 
and hope. It's a feast in God's kingdom and the table is ready. What can you bring this morning? Bring yourself and bring some folks with you so that house, God's house can be full. Jesus is saying to each person here this morning, no matter how great your sin, come. I've prepared everything for you. I want to be in relationship with you and for you to know my Father. And I want you to be saved from God's wrath and judgment. And to dine with me, to dine with my people, my church, for eternity. Will you say yes? Will you say yes? I'm coming, Lord. I'm all in. I want to invite you to do that this morning. What, a, what does that mean for you? Maybe saying a prayer in your heart. Just saying, Lord, I'm coming. I'm coming back. Maybe it means coming down and asking for prayer this morning. Now's the time. We're family here. Come and let us pray over you for spiritual strength. And maybe it's I'm coming for the first time. I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to be baptized into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sin. And that's how you're invited to the table. That's the banquet that God's prepared. So imagine. Imagine the feast this morning. And as we stand and sing, I'm going to stay up here and, and just come. If we can pray for you, if we can encourage you, or just say that prayer in your heart. Let's stand and let's come to the feast together. We are alone.